So thank you for joining us bright and early on the last day of the conference. Uh, we've got a great audience here in the room with us, and I'd also like to welcome all of you joining us remotely as well. This is session N5A, Design of Curved Members by Bo Dowswell. The PDH code for this session is 68423. My name is Margaret Matthew. I'm with AISC. I'll be moderating the session today. We've got a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll jump into the presentation. To obtain PDHs, you will need to visit www.aisc.org slash NASCCPDH. You can do this from your mobile device, from any computer, or from the stations set up on the 300 level in the convention center. For this presentation, the speaker will address questions at the end of the session. Due to time constraints, we may not be able to address all questions. For those of you in the room with us, simply raise your hand with any questions. For the remote audience, you'll find instructions for submitting questions included on the viewing page. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Bo Dowswell is a principal of ARC International, an engineering firm specializing in design and research for steel structures. Bo has been in the steel industry since 1985, the first nine years as a detailer. He received a PhD in structural engineering for his research on gusset plates and is an adjunct professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is a professional engineer and has published several journal, journal articles on steel connection design and beam stability. Bo is a member of the AISC Committee on Specifications, the AISC Committee on Manuals, and the AISC Committee on Industrial Buildings and Non-Building Structures. If we could welcome him, please. Thanks, Margaret. Let's do one more time on the PDH code before we turn the page. Next time you'll see it'll be at the very end. It won't give you the opportunity to sneak out early. Six, eight, four, two, three. Now this is a pretty timely presentation being that the curved member design guide is about to be released. It's gonna be design guide number 33 and everything that we're gonna be talking about in here is gonna be information that will be in the design guide. One of the things, the, the primary thing we'll be talking about is vertically curved members. And this is what we're talking about here. Uh, you'll notice that uh, th this is actually the same structure, I believe, uh, under construction on the left-hand side and then the finished product on the right-hand side. One thing about this is that uh, once we start talking about arches in this session, uh, you'll notice that this kind of looks like an arch and uh, it gives you that, that uh, nice uh, visual appeal to this, to this structure for the architects, but it can't be designed as an arch. And the reason is because you see, well, on this, this side, you can see that member stops before it goes to the bottom of the, uh, to the foundation. And this member stops short. It, it doesn't go all the way to the foundation. So it is not able to carry a compression load through there. So, so this is what I'll call a vertically curved member. And, and it looks to me like it behaves more like a beam than an arch, although you get that good visual effect. On the other hand, this is a, uh, it looks like a parabolic arch supporting this pedestrian bridge. And this one also, especially with the, uh, it's really artistic with the, the reflection in the water there. So the, the, you, it looks like the, the arches if you look closely, they're kind of tilted towards one another, and it looks like they maybe even cross in the uh, center. I don't know. That some, of, some of these pictures came from some of the uh, bender rollers that may be in the room. Maybe they can tell us. But uh, this is uh, just a, a really nice pedestrian bridge. I, that may be a museum or something like that that it leads to. Another thing that we'll talk about briefly in the presentation uh, that's covered heavily in the design guide is horizontally curved members. And this is what we're talking about with the horizontally curved. 
The figure on the left, obviously it has to be curved for a reason. You know, that, that can't just go straight unless you just want to go out wherever this leads to, way out here. Uh, they, they, the people that designed this wanted to take you over on this side and you can't just make a, a uh, 90 degree curve without a, a uh, radius in there. It might disrupt some things on that. I assume that's a rail system. All right, so that one is necessary. Another reason uh, that probably you're not gonna uh, get much information on, uh, we don't have any figures for this, but in industrial structures, you have horizontally and vertically curved members, and, and that's kind of a, a lot of the uh, practical, uh, uh, the, the uh, practical information that I got designing these things for the last couple of decades in industrial structures. Uh, one example would be, and I know that uh, when I say things like ductwork, you think of something that's this big, maybe in your house or maybe up here in the uh, convention center, but uh, flue gas ductwork for industrial power plants might be, you know, 30 or 40 feet high, you know, and you've got these, these curved stiffeners that go around the edges. And um, previously there was really not a set way to design these to the United States codes. There's a British publication we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, we need to give them credit because uh, we some of the ideas came out of that publication. Uh, horizontal horizontal members in uh, industrial structures, for example, you ha you might have a giant, you know, 700 foot tall chimney, and uh, you you have a, a grid within that chimney, a circular grid, and that would be a horizontally curved because it's in the horizontal plane. Otherwise, on the right-hand side, you have uh, a commercial structure, it looks maybe like a gym or something like that. And uh, you see the horizontally curved roof beam that gives a, a nice effect on, on that. And that's also carrying the roof load. On the, the uh, opposite end of the spectrum, the one in the middle, the, the UFO looking one, it, uh, it's probably not carrying much load. It's probably just a sunscreen or something like that, or some type of canopy. But uh, the reason I know it's not carrying much load is because you can look at it. And, and once we get to the end of the presentation, I think you will be able to, too. You can look at it and see it's uh, the whole 360 degrees. It's only got three spans in that. And so it's... Um, it's got a, it's got a pretty wide span, and if you had significant load on that, it would it would lead to significant uh, deformations that you could probably see from way out where we're looking at it. And also another thing to note on this that uh, we'll we'll talk about a little bit is if you look really closely, those are HSS members. The curved members are the reason for that is the torsional stiffness of an HSS. Now I showed you one specialty bend already, that was the parabolic curve. Another specialty bend is called an S-curve. And you can see in the, the, uh, that there are multiple canopies up here that are bent into an S-curve. And what that means is that there's kind of uh, a, a point where it, it's got a radius up to this point and then it turns around and bends in the other direction, a radius in the opposite direction. So that's called an S-curve. If you're a bender roller, if you're in college taking a, a civil engineering class on transportation, it's called a reverse compound bend. So if, if you're designing uh, roadways, uh, you would probably know that as a reverse compound. And the reason that I kind of bring this up is to let you know that at the, at the uh, near the end of the document, design guide 33, we have a glossary. And that glossary kind of combines all of these terms. And, it, you know, it, it, I can't remember if we called this a reverse compound or an S-curve, but whatever we put it under, we said this is also known as the other one. So it, it will allow kind of a link between the bender roller and the uh, civil engineer. And what, what are the guys in between call it? I don't know. I mean, the fabricator may call it uh, an S curve and uh, you know the detailer may call it a reverse compound bend. I'm not sure about that but it kind of gives a link in there to uh, all of the various terminology. 
Another specialty bend is an elliptical curve. The elliptical and the parabolic are known as variable radius curves, and that's because they have a variable radius. Those aren't the two, the only two variable radius curves. You can have any variable radius curve you want. You can make up your own curve, and uh, the guys, the, the bender rollers can, can uh, do it for you. But the two main ones are parabolic and elliptical. The reason this is elliptical instead of just round, if you look down at the plan view on this, it's going to be a radius. That, that uh, roof is going to be a radius. But when you tilt it up, and I know that if there are any detailers in the audience, you'll, they'll know that if you, when you tilt it up at an angle, that you have to make the uh, member curved in elliptical shape. Another specialty bend is an off-axis curve. This is another case where if you look down at the plan view of this roof, it will be a radius, but this edge beam, it's an HSS member here that goes from here around here at the at, uh, radius of the roof, it's rotated, if you look closely, in the plane of the roof. So that's why this is called an off-axis curve. And the reason we're, we have different names for these things is that there are different requirements. For example, if you're a detailer, you would need to know that you need to, to draw a section of that member and show what angle it's rotated at, you know, before they can bend it. You know, they can't just, uh, you know, bend it without knowing all of the uh, geometry that's required. So, so um, you know, you, you can, we, we define these curves uh, near the front of the uh, design guide, and then you know there are requirements. Once we get into the later chapters on the, on the detailing requirements for these, and you can kind of match it up with the terminology like that to get your requirements. And then, last but not least, is the uh, on the specialty bins is the spiral, and uh, everybody knows what the spiral is. This is a really nice looking, tight, curved spiral. Uh, the thing about this is, is that I started looking into, you know, we were trying to work all these definitions out, and I, I got in, and of course, every this is a spiral stair, right? But once you start looking at all these definitions, because I, I, I wanted to approach it from, you know, a, a practical standpoint and make sure that we got the technical definitions right, too, so that everybody could kind of, you know, there was no argument on what the terminology was, but the a spiral is... is the definition of a spiral is a two-dimensional curve that kind of starts at some radius and expands. So this is technically not a spiral stair, but it's just become called, it, over the years, it's been called a spiral stair to where it's become that terminology. Uh, this is officially a helical curve. But I think we'll, we'll just keep calling these spirals. All right, just real briefly, I want to give you kind of an introduction into the structural behavior of curved members. And this is just three slides. We're still kind of in an introduction before we get into the vertically curved member design part where we'll hit all of the equations and uh, kind of uh, probably get a little bit uh, lost in the equations a little bit. But before we did that, I, I wanted to kind of just give you an overview of where we're headed with this. And the main thing that I wanted to show you on these next three slides is that curved members are not equal to straight members. For example, if you have an arch, an arch member under pure compression, all right, think of a straight column under pure compression. How does that buckle? If you've got pinned ends, it's going to buckle in a half sine wave, right? It's just going to, you know, you've got your straight member put a compression load on it, it's going to be a half sine wave, pinned in column, buckle shape, buckle shape. Well, let's say you put this arch in pure compression, and the buckle shape looks like this. At least this is one buckle shape. That's the preferred buckle shape, if there is such a thing that we'll have. We'll talk more about that later. There are other ways for this to buckle, but we're going to try and and uh, design for this type of buckling. I'll call it kind of a side sway type buckling. So you load this up, and, and let's just say that we want to stretch this out. 
you know, into a straight member. We'll, we'll stretch that into a straight member. Your buckled shape would look something like a full sine wave, which is what you would get with a straight column if you put a brace right at the mid height of that column you would get a full sine wave, assuming that it's a pin-pin column. So you can kind of think of this as a, a laterally braced column, even though we're kind of explicitly saying up here that curved members are not equal to straight members. All right, so that's kind of what I'm trying to hammer home in these next three slides, and then we'll kind of switch it, do the switcheroo on you and say that we can design as straight members a little bit later, but we have to do a few things to make them behave like straight members in our calculations. Now let's look at horizontal curvature. Let's say you have something in the horizontal plane that's curved and um, you want to put a flexural load on it. All right, normally we would have just a straight beam. Let's say we have a straight beam with equal end moments. You're going to get, uh, assuming that you have no buckling or anything like that, you're going to have a, a pure flexural load in that beam. And this is why curved beams behave dramatically different from straight beams. It's because once you put a curvature in there and apply equal, end, equal and opposite end moments to that flexural member, you get flexure plus torsion. All right, so we'll see how to handle that a little bit later. Now, the last thing that I wanted to talk about in this uh, introduction, at least as far as the, the uh, kind of the failure modes of these curved members, is the local strength. And you, you really kind of, when you're, when you're looking at it from a, a far away view, you know, trying to design members and arches and things like that that may be, I don't know, a few hundred feet long sometimes for a bridge structure, you don't really tend to think about the details of it like this, but let's just say that you have what I'm calling an in-plane moment, a moment in the plane of curvature, like I've got shown up here, M sub I. And let's just say it's in this direction I've got shown with the inner flange in compression, the outer flange in tension. And what happens, what can happen, is the flanges kind of tend to pull towards one another. The top flange will pull down and if we drew the bottom flange it would curl up and it's kind of a, a strange thing to think about just looking at the figure but uh, if you kind of get more in depth let's just say that we kind of like you were designing a moment connection we'll take that moment and break it down into the flange forces at the top and bottom we'll divide we'll divide this moment by d minus t sub f to get the distance to the centroid of the flanges and put a force up here and a force here to equal that moment, we'll kind of take away the web and just draw the free body diagram of that top flange. So you've got a force here coming down in compression, the force here in compression. Well, the horizontal forces, the horizontal component of those forces will cancel out, but then you have a vertical component because it's a kind of a skewed load. You have a vertical component coming down and those will add to each other, and they, the, the flange by itself without the web to support it is not in equilibrium. You have to have that web to resist that force. So that's what happens. You have a force in that web, and these outer parts of this flange, try, the, the, the radial component of that force that we just talked about is trying to uh, get down this way, but before it can, it needs to get over to the web. And the way it does that, it's kind of a cantilever beam type action, uh, and it, eventually it works its way over to the web, and that same compression force will uh, also potentially buckle that web if you're, if you're not careful. Uh, I will say this, we're not going to discuss this any further in this presentation. There are equations, good simple equations in the design guide to handle this, the, the flange bending problem only comes in if you have a relatively small radius and a high width to thickness ratio of, of the flange. So for example, let's say that you have a 15-foot radius um, on a 
on a uh, W21, the thinnest W21 flange, that might be a case where you might want to check into this. But if you have a 40 foot radius with a W16 beam, you're probably not going to have to worry about this. On the other hand, uh, this one where you get the web buckling, you almost will never have to worry about it. I, I included it just for completeness in the design guide in case you want to do a, a uh, really tight radius, maybe a, a five foot radius on something that's uh, 20 inches deep with a three eighths thick web, then you might start thinking about this web buckling thing. Otherwise, if you've got normal, a normal radius that you would have in a building, this one is not even gonna control, but you do have a nice easy equation in there, so it doesn't hurt to check it. Okay, what we're gonna talk about in here, we're gonna briefly go over a, the uh, Design Guide 33. Essentially, I'll just go through the contents and show you what's in there. Um, to me, that's kind of um, not really what the session's about, so I kind of want to skim through that. Just make sure you know what's going to be in it and then kind of move on. We'll briefly cover curving of steel members. I think I've got about six slides on that roughly, and uh, we'll talk about how these members are curved. And then the bulk of our presentation will be in this next one, the vertically curved members, where we'll hit all the equations and um, uh, Hopefully that uh, uh, we can make it through that. And if we can, um, then we'll briefly cover horizontally curved members just to kind of give you an overview of the behavior. Okay, first of all, I wanna talk about the, the approach that we used in the design guide. Obviously it's a design guide, so we wanna provide design guidance, right? And uh, we provide design guidance on vertically curved members, horizontally curved members, and connections. All right, so there's some good information on connections in there, but it's more of a thing, you know, we do get examples in there for you too, but it's more of a thing like for, uh, you know, it, it kind of leaves a lot of it up to you. I'll show you some examples, but uh, for example, on the, on the horizontally curved members, uh, it says things like make sure you account for the torsion, you know, so the connections are going to be different, but uh, it kind of just tells you what you need to handle. It's not going to give you, you know, uh, full-blown um, connections to use it on these members. But one of the things that I really wanted to do in this is to provide practical information. And um, the reason for this, you know, if you go all the way back to Design Guide 1, um, I, was in, I was in the industry using the first edition of Design Guide 1. And of course, you, you know, as I said, you can expect to have design information in there. So if you had to design a base plate, you would go to Design Guide 1 and design your base plate. So all the equations were in there in a good handy spot. But the thing that stood out to me about Design Guide 1 was not so, you know, you can get the equations anywhere or you can make up your own equations. The thing that stood out to me is it had all this good practical information from people that had been there. For example, you know, if I needed to know how big of a base plate can I have before I need to put grout holes in. I remember, I remember going there for that, and it's in there. I remember going there for how thick of a washer plate do I need for a certain anchor rod size, and that's in there. So all of this good practical information is in there and uh, things like shear lug design. And that's what I wanted to do for this one too. You know, really we've only got two chapters. We got one chapter for vertically curved and one chapter for horizontally curved and then a chapter on examples. So that's really kind of all the hard numbers and equations, that's where they all are. The rest of it's kind of all this practical information. So the contents, chapter one's in an introduction. You'll see a lot of the same pictures I showed you earlier. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, didn't get uh, to put too many of the industrial pictures in there. They aren't, they aren't all that glamorous anyway, so, uh, so I didn't mind too much when we uh, couldn't fit those in. 
Chapter 2 talks about curving steel members, and we'll briefly cover that today so you'll know what that's all about. Um, there, there are just several bending processes that you go through. And also it talks about bending geometries. Obviously, I think everybody knows how to calculate all the geometry of a circle, but what about a, a parabolic curve? Uh, one good thing that uh, is in there is that it gives you, a lot of times you'll need to use the, the, the curved length of a curve. And we all know how to do that for a circle, for a radius circle. Uh, for for a, a, a parabolic curve, it gives you uh, the equations to calculate that, uh, what I'll call the developed length of the curved member or the, or the, uh, the arc length of the curved member. Okay, chapter three, design for bending. It kind of builds on chapter two, and this is kind of more for engineers and architects that um, before you bend a member, you need to know what the result is going to be. If you're an architect, you don't want a lot of distortion in your member when you bend it. Uh, chapter three will kind of provide some general guidance for that. One thing I will mention is that a lot of the information in chapter three came from bender rollers. Uh, that, I, that, you know, I work closely with the bender roller committee to get a lot of the information in chapter three. So probably the best thing for you to do, look at chapter three and, uh, give some of the bender rollers a call and find out what they re recommend for you. Uh, there are things that you can do in the design process. For example, they, they might tell you that uh, use a, a slightly thicker wall on your HSS section. Let's say that you've designed a, an, a rectangular HSS that's got a quarter inch thick wall and it's stressed to about 15%, but maybe that's what the size of the architect wanted. Uh, so you're not really too much worried about stresses but they tell you that it's a too tight of a radius to uh, bend without distortion when you're trying to get an AESS, an architecturally exposed look to the structure. Well, they might say, well, we need to increase this wall thickness to limit this distortion to the amount that you want. So that's good information you can get right up front without having to go back and redesign things several times. Uh, it's best just to get, get in touch with them up front and uh, kind of know what you're getting into. Another thing that we talk about in there is fracture. That's not uh, much of a problem, and uh, most of the time the bender rollers can give you good information on that. And I'm talking about fracture during the bending operation. I mean, if you bend to a super tight radius, obviously there's going to be a, a chance for that. Uh, chapter four, good practical information on fabrication and detailing. Uh, this is not uh, the bending operations or, or what the bender rollers would do. And then the way it works, okay, so I don't know if there are uh, any fabricators in the audience, but the way it works is that uh, the fabricator, you know, they can bend things, but most of the time they're limited to bending for camber. You know, they, they might have a cambering machine, and of course that's going to kind of give you a, a really a really high radius. These aren't the, the smaller radiuses like we're talking about. Um, so what happens is the fabricator will typically sub out to a bender roller company that specializes in bending and uh, uh, get the bending done that way rather than do it himself in the shop. So this chapter four is typically for the fabricator and the detailer, for the steel fabricator before you know, to let them know what the bender roller needs or uh, for the detailer to let them know, for example, that off axis curve, you know, the detailer needs to put that twist dimension in there for the bender roller to be able to do his job properly. Okay, chapter five, this is not really a place where you're going to spend too much time if you're an engineer, but it does have some good information in there on just general issues. For example, material properties. I work a little bit with uh, Larry Muir in the uh, Steel Solutions Center, and over the past few years we've gotten quite a bit of uh, questions on the material properties and uh, distortion and things like that and how to handle these things. And, you know, questions like if I've been this certain size uh, wide flange to a certain radius 
is it going to affect my member properties? And the answer typically is no, not uh, for normal radii that you would find in buildings and not for something that's enclosed. But if you roll something to a tight radius and you send, let's say you want to galvanize it and then send it to some uh, low service temperature location to be used in an exposed, exposed to the weather, then you might end up uh, wanting to have the information in chapter five to, to uh, determine if you're going to have a, a brittle fracture uh, problem or not. Okay, in chapter six and seven are the vertically and horizontally curved members. That's where all the design equations are for, um, you know, the buckling calculations and the strength calculations. Chapter eight, design examples. That's going to be two horizontally curved examples and one vertically curved. And uh, the vertically, one of the, the uh, horizontally curved and the vertically curved both include the connection design with full calcs on that. Next up is the glossary that we've already talked about. And last but not least is the list of vendor roller companies. And we kind of uh, put that in the back so that you can kind of flip right to it and uh, see who to get in touch with if you have a question about the uh, uh, bending process. Okay, just a brief overview. You'll find a ton of information on this in the design guide on curving steel members. <laughs> there are really three major ways that structural steel members are bent. And they're the top three up here, the pyramid roll bending, incremental step bending, and induction bending. Rotary draw bending is used typically for smaller pieces, like if you have a pipe that's bent to a really tight radius, or maybe, uh, I don't know, furniture, you know, furniture legs, something like that. So typically that's not going to be used for large structural members. And there are a lot of other processes. You know, it's just a lot of these are proprietary processes, so they're, they can make up a method and, uh, and use it if they think that it's going to give the, the uh, finished product that you want. So first off, this is... Uh, uh, probably the most common method, and there, there are a lot of commercial machines out there to do this. It's a cold bending method, the pyramid roll bending, which means it's done at room temperature. And uh, what happens is, you know, when I, when I used to uh, detail steel, um, I would kind of envision this. I'd, I'd seen a picture that was similar to this, and I envisioned, well, they would just stick the member in, roll it, and uh, put it on the truck. Well, that's not really the way it happens. You, you've got these three rolls that oppose each other. You can kind of see I've drawn the forces in there so that just to show how it works. And uh, that's why it's called pyramid roll bending is because they're in a pyramid shape. This can be in the vertical plane or the horizontal plane. And the member is fed through and it's bent to a certain radius, and then the, the rolls are adjusted, and then it's fed through again, and the rolls are adjusted again, and then it's fed through until finally, after several passes through, you get the radius that you want. Here are photographs of the method. These are both in the horizontal plane. You can see the three. Uh, this is a kind of good picture for this presentation because the three main rolls are the red ones. These are the pyramid shaped rolls. And there's a supplementary roll here too that, that's used to, to limit the distortion of that tension flange. Now this one over here, this is a T-section if you look closely. And you can see that it's in these grooved rolls just to keep it from... Uh, uh, you know, to stabilize it as it goes through the rolls because it's subject to, you know, pretty high, uh, well over the yield stress to be able to bend it. And one other thing, too, is that you'll notice this, 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 this the two rolls are here and the one roll is here. So this stem is in compression, 
if you look closely, this role is kind of a specialized role to sandwich that web to prevent distortion. Because that's going to be in compression. It's going to tend to buckle out out of plane when it's rolled. So that's what those, those specialized rolls are used for. Another method, incremental step bending. And it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but uh, this is kind of a close-up view. You've got the member being bent. It looks like a rectangular HSS. And what happens is, is the member is fed through, and then a force is applied. This is the bending machine. A force is applied in kind of a cantilever bending action. And then it's fed through again. That's the incremental part. And uh, then it's bent again. So as the member passes through the machine, it's kind of bent incrementally as it goes along. This is a cold bending method too. Now for the only hot bending method that we'll talk about is this uh, induction bending. And I really didn't know much about this when I uh, started writing this design guide, but uh, it's, it's a really interesting process. What happens is this, uh, that's a person, so that gives you an idea of how big the, these uh, bent members are, which by the way, first of all, you can look at the, uh, the members that have already been bent here, and that's a pretty big diameter to thickness ratio on that. And just from this view way back here, you can't really see any distortion in that tube. Um, and that's a pretty high uh, slenderness ratio on that tube to not have any distortion. But this induction bending method can do things like this. What happens is that the member is fed from, you know, no telling how long it is. Maybe it's all the way back here and it's fed through the machine and straight, it's straight to this point. And then it gets to this point where it's heated up with an induction coil, and then it's cooled right after that. And it's fed through, in this case, a continuous, it's fed through at a continuous rate. And uh, it is, it's, this heated portion causes the curvature because it's, there's a radius arm or a pivot arm where this member is attached. And as it moves through, it kind of pivots around, a, uh, around that radius, bending only that portion that's heated. So it's a really interesting process. And here's kind of a drawing view of it. This is from that publication I was telling you about from, uh, from the uh, uh, British publication uh, from the Steel Construction Institute published in 2001. And this is a, a really good picture of what happens. You can see the straight member being fed through, it hits the induction coil, and then it goes around this, what they're calling the radius arm and eventually you end up with a really nice bend. The primary thing that I wanted to discuss on this is that each of these bending methods has advantages and disadvantages. And each of the bender roller companies has different equipment and different personnel and different shop layouts. So they're, the available things that they can do are different. For example, one may specialize in the induction bending. Uh, maybe one specializes in bending really heavy members about the strong axis. Uh, one may have, uh, it takes specialized equipment to roll, to uh, bend a uh, spiral stair. The reason is because you, you, you have those same setup maybe, uh, Typically, the way it's done is with that pyramid roll bending, and uh, but the rolls have to be really wide. You know, you can't just feed it in straight because it has to be fed in at you know at the angle of the stair. So you can envision that you have to have specialized equipment, you know, really wide rolls to be able to roll to curve a spiral stair, and you also have to have a lot of shop layout space and you know the the knowledge to to uh, be able to do, because that's a pretty complex um, curve, especially by the time you start getting the treads and the connections laid out and uh, trying to get it within tolerance and everything. So, uh, you know, there are people that specialize in that. All right, let's move on to the technical part of the presentation. And um, 
We're going to talk, like I said, about vertically curved members for most of the uh, remainder. I think we spend about 20 minutes or 15 minutes or so on the horizontally curved, just kind of skimming over. But uh, let's go in pretty deep on these vertically curved. The first thing we're going to do is talk about the axial strength and then the flexural strength. Um, and then, of course, if you have both, which you will in almost every case, just like in a normal structure, you'll have axial and flexural loads in there. So you need to know how to combine those loads. So on the axial strength, you typically think of an arch under axial compression. That's why they're so efficient. You know, of course, they've been used for thousands of years. And they're so efficient because they're, they're, um, because they're, they're primarily in compression. You know, you, you would like to think that they're 100% in compression, like this one looks like a parabolic arch. Um, but there are some things that cause um, flexure, in-plane flexure on these arches. For example, let's just look at the uh, one on the right because that's the one that's uh, most often used. And the reason is because if you put a, a, a span load like this W, over the whole span L sub S, you will end up theoretically, if everything is perfect, with pure compression due to that loading on a parabolic arch. If you have a circular arch, you need this type of loading, a pressure type of loading, which of course in a building structure you never get. If you're an industrial guy, uh, your, your pressure load might cause that. Um, but that might be the only place where you get pure compression on the circular arch. So the parabolic arch, let's go back to this one. Let's say you want to get pure compression in this thing. Well, first off, you have a pin connection in there, and we know that we can never get a true frictionless pin. So that's kind of going to cause some moment in there. Um, we know that we can't have, even just straight out of the mill, a straight member is not going to be straight. Uh, actually, um, if you look in the code of standard practice, the curved members um, kind of tend to uh, be within, uh, at a tolerance equal to what a straight member would be, which I'm talking about the latest code of standard practice. I believe it's the 2016 that explicitly has information in there on curved members now. So you might want to check that out if you're not familiar with it yet. Okay, so we've got some out of straightness of this member that's going to cause moment. And then, more than likely, we're not going to end up with just this full span loaded. You know, you might have a, a patch load over here. If it's a bridge, you might have, uh, you know, cars over here and none over here, for example. Uh, another thing, like if you're in a building, you might have a hanger over here causing a concentrated load. That's going to cause a moment. If you're exposed to the wind, you might have a horizontal wind load causing moment. So the point I'm getting at is that you'll never have a perfect arch. You'll always have moment in there. We talked about the buckled shape, and it, it kind of sounds a little strange when I say it like this, but that's the preferred buckled shape. Of course, we don't we don't have a uh, we don't prefer it to buckle at all. But if it uh, if we're going to design against buckling, we need to design against this type of buckling. And I'll show you why in just a minute. One thing you can get with these is uh, support spreading. Uh, this is something that you really need to be, watch out for. In a typical structure, it's not going to cause too much of a problem. But for this in-plane strength of these arches, let's say that uh, uh, you, you put an, uh, an arch. You're going to try and design this as an arch rather than a, a flexural member, and you uh, put it on two cantilever columns, well, you might get a deflected shape, kind of like what I've got shown in the figure up there. And if you do, you're going to get a pretty big deflection at the apex of that arch, which, of course, is going to be a serviceability problem. But even worse, what happens is that arch can get weaker and buckle in, in a... Uh, snap through buckling type mode that we'll talk about in just a minute where it kind of just flip flops on us. Uh, so when you get uh, this type of deflection and support spreading, uh, you need to be really careful on your design 
Um, probably if you're going to design for compre for this picture up here, I would probably just design as a vertical beam if I were doing it by hand. Um, I'm sure everybody's going to probably model this as a finite element model, uh, which uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in just a minute. One thing about this is uh, if you want to if you want to uh, upset your architect, you can put a tension tie in there like this, but uh, that's of course going to obstruct the view of the arch from the inside. Another thing is provide a vertical truss, like I've got shown on the right-hand side, that uh, prevents or at least reduces that support spreading. Okay, this snap-through buckling is kind of a fun topic, at least for me. And... Um, what we're going to do is try to prevent snap-through buckling so that we can design for the other type of buckling that I showed you, that kind of that side sway looking thing. And the reason is because this is difficult to predict and it's, it's so sensitive to the second order effects and the support spreading that it, it's, even though we've got theoretical equations to prevent the snap-through buckling, we really don't know how close we're going to be able to get because we don't have perfectly fixed connections, you know, we're going to get some support spreading no matter what we do. And here's what snap-through buckling is. Um, kind of just the name itself tells you a lot about what's happening. And, you know, I, I, I exhausted all of my resources looking for a technical definition of what snap-through buckling was so that I could put, I mean, I wanted to put some a good practical definition that, that even I could understand in this uh, design guide. And I mean, I kept getting things, all of these publications, I mean, they were nice descriptions and they were theoretically correct, but I mean, I read through it and I, I really couldn't even understand what they were trying to talk about. You know, m most of them were, you know, uh, three or four lines long and it said things like, um, Snap through buckling is a type of buckling where your non buckled shape upon loading goes into a stable state upon buckling. So, so, I mean, by the time you get to the end of that, you don't even know what the first part of the sentence said. Snap through buckling is what I've got shown here. You've got the, the original shape of the art up here. You load it up, it goes down to A, the first dotted line, just normal deflection. And then you load it up more and it can kind of snap through all the way down to C. And I actually meant to, uh, well, I can do it with this business card. You know, I mean, I, as kids, do you, do, you, do you remember doing the thing where you where you kind of, I don't know why it was uh, something that we did as kids, but you could kind of make an arch out of this, and then right when you put a load on it, it kind of snaps down like this. You know, so that's that's what snap through buckling is, like that. Um, the, probably better to do it with something big for the guys in the back, but but you uh, but you end up with something like this. You know, that's snap through buckling, and you can see what happens. If H, our rise dimension on this arch, I've got labeled up here, let's say that that's uh, 30 feet over uh, some long span, and uh, there are people in here doing things like listening to still presentations, and all of a sudden you get a snap through buckling. That's going to be, of course, a catastrophic failure because it's going to drop down that, whatever I called that, 30 feet, it's going to drop down 60 feet just immediately. So obviously we want to prevent that. Uh, I put B in there for completeness. There, th this is also a possible failure mode, but uh, this is kind of just to give you an idea of what happens anyways. But uh, I, I was thinking that if I didn't put uh, that curve B for the anti-symmetric mode, that uh, somebody might uh, say, why didn't you put this anti-symmetric mode in there? That's a possibility too. Okay, luckily for us, there's, there were a couple of general rules out there. If your H over L sub S 
is greater than 0.2, you don't have to worry about snap through buckling. All right, all of this is in the design guide where H, of course, is our rise dimension of that arch and L sub S is the straight line, what I'm calling the span of that arch. And the reason I'm kind of making a big deal calling it the straight line or the span is because later on we're going to talk about the developed length, which is the curved length of that arch. So what do you do if H over L sub S is less than or equal to 0.2? Well, I found a good bit of information on that too. Part of this came from that original design guide, the British publication I told you about. And part of it came, I think I had three or four different references on this that I kind of pulled numbers that were really close to one another. So I pulled, uh, I think I just used the conservative values out of the literature to make up this table. You've got a little more work to do if you're in this range of H over L sub S. And what you do is go into this table, which is in the design guide, and it gives you an L sub S, a span length over radius of gyration, which is the in-plane radius of gyration R sub I. Uh, you take that L sub S over R sub I ratio and uh, make sure that it's bigger than what's in this table. So for example, let's say that we have an H over L sub S of 0.15 and we have pinned in conditions. We just need to make sure that our uh, L over R ratio is greater than 36. And I think I'm probably going to get a question on this if I don't go ahead and address it. Because when I look back at the design guide, I've, you know, you know how when you, you uh, whenever you write something and you kind of look back at it after about a month, sometimes you say, "What in the world is going on here?" And that's what happened to me when I looked at this. I said, "I said, why is this greater than?" Because if you're designing a column, you want a small slenderness, right? You don't want a big slenderness. So I started thinking about why in the world would you need a bigger slenderness? Uh, why is that preferred? So in other words, we're, just like I said, I mean, it's just, it, that's, that's correct. It must not exceed this critical ratio in the table. So we need greater than 36. And the reason is that this snap through buckling, and this will kind of give you an idea on how you need to build your finite element models too, um, which are discussed in the design guide. The, the snap through buckling is dependent on the axial stiffness of the arch. In other words, you think PL over AE. You know, the delta equals PL over AE. That's your axial stiffness. And of course, you can get that from your finite element model. So that's snap through buckling. The other type of buckling that I showed you is more similar to the column buckling, which is dependent on the L over R ratio. So it's more dependent on the slenderness. So the higher your slenderness is relative to your, your E times A, your axial stiffness, the more likely you are to get the preferred type of buckling. So that, uh, if that makes sense, uh, I, I think I, uh, um, after, I, after I went back and thought about it, I, I kind of um, convinced myself that uh, we had the right thing in there. But that's the way all of the publications are written. So I kind of um, went back and reviewed some of that too while I was at it. But it, that is the right uh, the right verbiage up there. It must exceed the L over R critical. So here's what we're going to do. We, we, uh, this is based on the way that I, I had uh, done this for a couple of decades now on industrial structures. What we're going to do is we're going to design the in-plane strength for axial compression using a straight column approach. In other words, we're, we're just going to somehow figure out a way. Now this is opposite of what I told you at the very beginning of the presentation, where we said curved members are not equal to straight members. And now I'm kind of backing up saying, well, what if you do this, this, and this, then you can design curved members as straight members. And that's what we're doing. We're gonna design this as that. One thing we have to do is we're gonna take the developed length or the arc length, uh, the curved length of that member, L sub D, 
and plug it in over here. That's going to be our column length. The next thing we have to do is come up with an effective length factor. We call it case of I for in-plane buckling. We have another one for out-of-plane buckling that we'll talk about in just a minute. And this is from at least probably three to six different references here, too, um, because all of the different references that are out there had different art forms and different end conditions and, and uh, a lot of different uh, uh, height to length ratios and things like that. So, so this is what uh, we came up with for the effective length factors in this table. This is also in the design guide. Here's your effective length factor here, K sub I. It's dependent on H over L sub S, and it's dependent on whether you have circular or parabolic curves and uh, pinned or fixed end conditions. So one thing to think about here that kind of works pretty well with the picture that I showed you earlier, let's take a look at, uh, we'll take a look at the parabolic pinned end conditions for all uh, H over LS ratios. You get you use a K sub I of 0.5. So that kind of makes sense, the 0.5, because it, like I said earlier, we're buckling in a full sine wave rather than a half sine wave. So we get to pretend like we're, our column has a brace right at the center, right at the mid height. And that's what the, using this K equals 0.5 does. If you have a roller, you're not gonna have axial compression. It'll be, if you have a roller, you'll design for uh, flexure. The question was, what if you have a roller? Um, but yeah, we'll talk about flexure in just a minute, how to handle that. Okay, the next thing we have to do is design for the maximum load within the arch. It's gonna, it's gonna vary along the length of that arch. So we take the maximum load anywhere along that L sub D, put that at the top of our column, and go to specification section E3, which is where you're used to going for straight columns. We're gonna design, and, and what that does, it gives us a way to design for inelastic effects and the out of straightness, uh, the geometric imperfections, without having to make up our own thing. If we go straight to section E3, we get to use the AIC column curve, uh, using the effective length and the uh, developed length for our column. And we're done. You know, that, that's uh, it's as simple as that. And the advantage of this is that I'm not going to get into too much on the finite element modeling. There's a little information in the design guide on this. But what, you, what I would normally do is do uh, a lot of straight members, you know, connected, of course, by nodes. So you're doing an incremental member in here to, to simulate that curve shape with straight members. And then you put in at least the the software that I use allows you to put in the length and the effective length factor. So we'll calculate that and take that uh, effective length factor out of the table so we know what those values are. You put that in your, your uh, software and then it gets down to the same way you would design a normal straight column. You press the button and if it's green, you're good. And if it's red, you need to go back and reevaluate. So that's kind of the beauty of doing it this way, is that uh, once you get everything into the finite element model, then you're kind of uh, ready to go. It's not any more complicated than a normal design. Now we're still on axial strength, but now we're gonna talk about the out of plane. We've got the, let's hold everything till the end. And uh, I think we'll have 10 minutes or so to discuss questions at the end. Um, and we can always come back to this slide if you want to talk about this slide. So the out-of-plane strength, we got the in-plane strength nailed down pretty good. The out-of-plane strength is going to be done similar, but the problem is that um, let's say that you have this member and it's braced only at the ends, and you've put that compression load, a pure compression, no moment, it's going to buckle like I've got shown in the section up here. You're going to have lateral translation and twisting of the cross section which means it's going to be a, a flexural torsional buckling. 
So that's going to complicate things a little bit, but uh, we, I think we can uh, handle it when I show you the equations that we've got to uh, convert between the two types of buckling. Most arches are, are braced. You'll see some every now and then that are mainly uh, just for the visual effect that are not braced, uh, but they're not very strong either. Most of the time you're gonna have bracing in the out of plane direction like I've got shown here. And what that means for us is that we have to check every segment just like you would for a column. If you had no bracing in the strong axis and you had 10 braces in the weak axis, you would have to check all of those segments for the weak axis, and then you would only have one calc in the strong axis. It's the same thing for arches. Another thing is that we've called this, this uh, dimension L sub dB, which is the developed length between braces, or the curved length between braces. So we'll use that in our equations for the out-of-plane buckling. Once again, we're designing as a straight member, a straight column, using specification section E3. And once again, P is the maximum load within the segment. Once again, L sub D, in this case, L sub DB is gonna be our column length. So now really, I think the only thing we have left to uh, look at is the effective length factor. Like I said before, this is going to be called K sub O. And the problem here is that we're trying to convert from one buckling form, flexural torsional buckling, to a flexural buckling because we said we're going into E3. It's a normal column design for flexural buckling in E3. The way to do that, if you set the, the uh, buckling equations equal, um, for this curved member, it comes up to this fairly simple equation. There are only two variables in here, but the reason is, is because we pulled out this one variable, C sub O, at, which has a ton of variables in it that I'll show you on the next page. So we've got C sub O and uh, this angle between braces, theta sub B. So theta sub B is um, uh, simply the, uh, the angle that you get uh, that corresponds to that L sub B. So that's a pretty simple equation, but like I said, this C sub O is kind of, you can think of it as kind of a torsional coefficient because it has the St. Benant torsion there and it has the, the uh, uh, warping constant there and the out of plane moment of inertia there, which is the moment of inertia perpendicular to the axis of curvature. But those are all things that we know. So, I mean, this is not, you know, you can look up a lot of these things in the, the uh, uh, properties of, in the steel manual and the other things we know, L sub DB, you know, we know all the geometry of the structure. So this shouldn't be too hard to calculate. 